Okay, so what, what's demonstrated in this patient's story is how hard it is to actually recognize a stroke and come to the hospital on time. And what hasn't been studied is how this is actually a social phenomenon. How in many ways the recognition of a stroke is not just from yourself. In fact, you may not have the ability because you're having a brain dysfunction, but in fact it's someone witnessing you. And it's the stories that people around you tell around what's happening to you that stimulate you to get to the hospital. And so just to review, a stroke, especially an ischemic stroke is what's the focus today, is a blockage of an artery. It's, it's like a heart attack except it occurs in the brain and it causes a death of a certain part of the brain because of a lack of blood flow which causes lack of oxygen to the brain. And it, every second we lose about seven million neurons, okay? So it's a very, very um, timely disease. We, we can intervene if the patient comes in within three hours of symptoms, all right? And what we do is we give them either a clot-blasting medication and we inject it into the vein or in, into the artery and it goes and it circulates and it, block, it, it reduces that clot. Okay, and that blood flow is restored. If the patient comes after three hours, or they have a very, very big clot, there's now new technology that has been evidence-based to remove the clot using a catheter and uh, pulling out or vacuum suctioning that clot out of the artery. But all of this needs to happen within six hours of stroke symptoms. After that, the patient is is basically out of luck. We, we can't offer, because what happens with these therapies is they cause increased bleeding risk. So that if they're given after six hours, then the patient has a higher risk of hemorrhage and, and no physician would want that. No patient would want that. So it's a, it, this early recognition is one of the biggest problems across the world, okay? Only 5% of patients actually get the medication, these medications mostly because they do not, do not come on time. So a huge, huge risk, um, public health risk. What are some of the risk factors that have been studied? So patients who are older age tend to come later. Patients who have a mild stroke tend to come later. Patients who are living alone tend to come later. Patients who are unmarried tend to come later. And patients who, have, who are black race tend to come later. These are epidemiological risk factors for coming to the hospital late. But none of them, as you can tell, deal with the social element, deal with the actual engagement of the patient with his or her social environment to actually recognize a stroke. This is a big uh, public health uh, problem and so there are um, uh, educational campaigns across the world um, this is in the United States. There's an acronym that we use called FAST, Face, Arm, Speech, Time to Call 911. These are, are plastered across billboards and highways, and, um, and we really try to reinforce this message. But um, actually, the, the numbers of patients who've come in on time still hasn't changed very much. It hasn't moved the needle. So we need a new approach. We need a new way to study this problem. And so the problem that my lab, um, the way that we visualize this is different, okay? Instead of thinking of a patient as an isolated node, we think of that patient as a network. And the network has a number of social contacts around the patient, and these contacts are connected to the patient with either strong or weak ties, okay? And you know, a patient as a mini network is, changes the entire mathematical foundation of doing risk analysis, right? So instead of thinking of it as epidemiological characteristics, you have to start incorporating relational characteristics and network properties of the patient in order to understand what that patient will do in relation to a stroke or a heart attack or whatever disease you want to study. It changes the mathematical foundation. So I'm going to show you my results off the bat. These are patients, okay? 
it's a beautiful, I think, a beautiful visualization of what a real patient is. It, it's not an individual who has a certain color skin and a certain age. It really are networks of people. And, um, and so these are all of the patients. These, this data is not available, so we had to actually collect the data. Um, and I'm going to tell you how we do this in a minute. But, um, but we had to collect the data to build, to build our data set to then analyze, build the fa foundation for a theory, and then think about the next step of extrapolating or trying to get more data to, to reinforce or to disprove our theory. Okay. So, um, I'm going to ask the audience now, which egocentric network structure, egocentric just means around the ego, around the patient, is associated with slow arrival to the hospital after stroke symptoms. And I'll tell you a story about each of these. Patient A is a patient who has a very strong family-centered network. Okay, so um, she's associated with five members of the family. She's very highly connected to three of them who live with her. And the other two are, are, are close by, but um, not as connected, not as strongly connected. But all of these family members are with her and they witness a stroke. Is that patient going to come in on time? And patient B has a larger network, some with strong ties, some weak ties, and the people may not know each other. You notice on the, in, in network A, all the people know each other. This, is, this means there's higher connectivity in the network. Patient B, there are people who do not know each other. So which patient, by a raise of your hand, do you think would, would come slowly? Would it be patient A? Okay. Would it be patient B? Okay. So that's what we all thought too. Okay? So we thought the, I mean, as medical doctors, we think the family is the most important ingredient to arrival, right? Because if the family is at the patient's bedside or at home watching the patient, then that, that's a great source of information and that's a great emergency source of support. So let me tell you the story of what happens. And there's theories for why both of these may be correct. So social support theory says that witness of events, solidarity of the network, trust, tangible support are very important to the patient arrival, very important to the patient's survival. And, but the other, um, the network theory is called social capital, okay? That perhaps a larger network would mean resources are embedded in the social structure. Perhaps there's a vision advantage because there's a diversity of information. So someone may have had a stroke in your network or they may have known person who had a stroke. Maybe that experience could percolate into your network, into your experience, and therefore you may react faster. And then there's heterogeneity in your in your network. There's, there's different types of people in your network who do not know each other, so perhaps there's a less redundant source of information. Okay? So these are, these are competing theories for why model A or model B would have been the right one. Here's the only mathematical equation I'm going to um, provide. This is constraint. Okay? Constraint, very simply, is the extent to which a manager's time and energy are concentrated in a single group of interconnected colleagues, which means no access to structural holes. So basically, it means that all the people around you are connected to each other. If that happens, then there's a lot more redundancy of information and, um, in your network because everyone knows everyone else's opinion. Okay? There's not, there's not going to be a lot of innovative new ideas because they just share each other's opinions very much. Um, this is the equation for constraint. It basically looks at the direct tie between a node of interest and the outside alter node and some of all of the um, indirect ties. Okay? And the things that influence constraint are the size of the network. Increased size means decreased constraint. The density of the network, increased density means increased constraint. Hierarchy is basically how many triangles are in the network. And then tie strength. So if everyone's a strong tie, that probably means there's increased constraint. A great way to visual think about this is your mother-in-law. Okay, I just got married a week ago, and um, and you know the mother-in-law is a very important figure 
in my network, not because I'm strongly tied to her, but because my wife is very strongly tied to her. So it's very difficult for me to cut the tie with my mother-in-law, no matter how much I want to try, because that would have a, it, it would be very hard to cut that without having my wife be very, very sad, right? And so she has an enormous amount of constraint on my network, okay? Okay, so that's, and then the methods. So we interviewed, um, we're now up to 70 uh, mild patients on hospital admission. Um, it was a network survey, very old-fashioned. Uh, we would sit next to them in the bedside, do a 20-minute, only 20-minute uh, survey. We asked, we had three name generators. A name generator is how you generate the names of the people around you. Um, who do you discuss important matters with? Who do you socialize with? And who, do you, who supports you? And then uh, we, we collected alter-alter ties, which means all the ways people are connected um, to each other of the first 10. So they, if they list 19, 20 people, we can only do the first 10 because it gets very um, cumbersome after that. So that was our method. And then we used R right from the beginning to um, do basic descriptive analysis and then a very simple logistic regression, okay? So we, we put in our known predictors um, that are in the literature well known for what cr increases delay. Um, and then we added uh, the network structure terms, the network composition terms um, in a logistic regression. And the outcome was a binary outcome. Did they come within six hours? Or did they not come without in six hours? Okay. Um, I'd like to mention our, our moderator uh, built one of the uh, packages that we used for this, which was iGraph. Um, we also used StatNet and uh, dplyr for the data manipulation. So um, we're very you know, proud to use R for this project because most of people in our community use SAS. And, um, and we're very happy to bring in this new, you know, in my community was a very new thing initially. So um, this is the result, all right? So the slow patients who came in slowly are on the left side of the screen. Patients who came in fast are on the right side of the screen. These um, networks are organized by increasing, decreasing constraint, okay? So the most constraint is in the top, and the least constraint is in the bottom. Okay. Um, what do people notice? Any observations of the slow people or the fast people? Let's start with network size. Are the people who come in fast, are they bigger? Sorry? Yes. So. People who tend to come in quickly have larger networks, all right? Now, are the people uh, who come in slowly, are their um, friends and family, are they really connected with each other, or are there a lot of holes in the network? Are there a lot of lack of connections? Sorry? They're very connected, right? So there's more triangles, there's more people who know each other, they're very central um, connectivity is, is, is increased, density is increased. The strength of ties, do you think that's uh, more, is it more red on the slow side compared to the fast side? How do you define strength? Yeah, strength was a question where we asked them about how close they feel to the person they nominated. And the options are extre uh, especially close, um, stranger is the, is the extreme, and then um, moderately close was the in-between. So what you're seeing here is a red tie is extremely close, a blue tie is moderate, and no tie is stranger. So you see a lot more red on the slow side, okay? So a lot more stronger ties. So um, compared to less either strangers or weak ties on the right. Okay, so constraint, which is a nice summary statistic, allows us to say that constraint is increased on the slow compared to the fast, okay? And um, here are some of the, the breakdown of the descriptive statistics. We also found that the mar uh, married, if you're married, that you're more likely to come in fast, um, but constraint and network size were definitively different across the two groups, even with a very small sample. Here's um, a box and whisker plot made in R. Um, of the constraint group, so um, 
constraint was increased in the slow arrivers compared to the fast arrivers. And then we did our logistic regression, and this was um, an adjusted, so for, adjusted for all of the, um, the known predictors. We found an adjusted odds ratio of 1.07 with a very highly significant p-value. Okay. So the answer to the question is personal networks with higher constraint are independently associated with slow arrival to the hospital after a stroke. The patient who has a family... Who, who is very connected to each other, tend to come in slower. Very counterintuitive. But we found the reason, we, we then explored why was that. We did qualitative interviews with each of the patients. And um, here's an example of a person who's describing a strong tie. She says, I talked to her on the phone earlier that day and told her. And I say, so you told her about your symptoms? She said, yes. Oh, yeah, we tell each other everything. So they're very... They communicate quite a bit, and she sa I say, okay, okay, and what, what, and she didn't mention that you should come in, um, and the participant says, she told me that I should probably lay down for a while. She was the one who told me I need to lay down and put my feet up for a while above my head or above my heart uh, with pillows, so that's why I stayed at home, okay? So that's a strong tie that's reinforcing um, what we don't want to happen, which is to rest, Here's a description of a weak tie. I called my aunt and told her my symptoms, and she told me that I probably was getting ready to have a stroke or something and that I needed to go. And I said, okay, when did you call your aunt? She said, about 20 minutes before I asked my nephew to bring me over there. And I said, okay, why did you call your aunt? And she says, because I knew she was a registered nurse. And, and I said, so she has experience with this. She says, uh-huh. And she says, okay, that's interesting. You just told her your symptoms. And she said you could come in. And she said, uh-huh. Do you talk with her about other symptoms as well? She says, no, not really. I hardly ever talk to her. Okay. And so there's this psychology theory that we are just um, playing with now called the transparency of um, the illusion of transparency. Okay. And what that means is with the closest people that we have next to us, we think they can read our minds, right? We think that they know what's happening to us without us having to profess what's happening. And whereas a stranger, you know, you have to tell everything because you don't know they, that they think the same way you do. So there's this illusion of transparency with the people who are closest. And we think that that's the phenomenon that could be happening here is that the family members minimize symptoms and they don't quite communicate as well about the stroke symptoms. So, in um, summary, the social capital, not family-oriented social support, is important for recognition of stroke symptoms and early arrival to the hospital. The possible mechanisms include resources embedded in the social structure, vision advantage, diversity of information, and then minimization by like-minded people in this illusion of transparency. So the conclusions are that patients should be considered mini-networks to understand complex health behaviors. Patients with higher constraint in their personal network arrive slower to the hospital after stroke, and social capital rather than family-oriented social support is the driving principle in this data. So moving forward, um, some of the questions we're asking is how can we more efficiently measure patient networks? So, you know, we're doing this in a very classical method of, net, of, of, of surveys at the bedside. Could we maybe gather their, their mobile phone information before the stroke and see which, which people had slow, uh, smaller networks and larger networks? That could be one way. And then what's an effective and feasible intervention to change patient behavior? How do you intervene? How do you get to the person with the small network? We have some ideas about that. We think that patients who come into the primary care clinic should have a little survey done about their network or they should have their phone analyzed. And then if they have a small network, maybe they should get extra education about stroke symptoms and maybe they should actually be encouraged to get more friends, you know, and to, you know, diversify their network. Maybe those are some suggestions. So this is what some of my lab is doing currently. We're looking at networks and stroke recovery. We're using body cameras to understand the number of interactions amongst stroke patients and their family members at home. We're looking at hospital networks in California and seeing how death may be a function of the network. Um, so if you're interested, this is our, our website and our Twitter and Facebook account. Please love to interact with all of you.
And then the last thing I'll just show here is we have a, a part of the lab is, is a textile artist, and she's transforming our networks into crochet. And, um, and this is a network of a patient. Um, I'm, uh, we don't have time, so I'm just going to tell you what this is. So this is a patient, and it's a tree ring diagram of an egocentric network. The, the, the closest ring is the first time period. The second ring is a second time period, and the third ring is the third time period. And, um, and these are the, the blue dots are the number of people in her network at the different time periods. Okay, so it's an artistic rendition of our network, and we're going to be displaying this in our hospital to show the importance of networks in uh, stroke families and, and, and stroke patients' lives. So thank you for your time.